for any real estate investor who wants to go into the private equity fund space where you want to just be very passive. You want to give a fund whatever money and have them handle it and you want your return and you want to do nothing. There are really good funds out there, but there are also ones that aren't. So do your homework, investigate, ask questions, vet where you're putting your money, vet them serious. Welcome back to the Investor Podcast. This is Liz Faircloth. And I am your co-host, Andressa Gadali. Are you tired of the endless pursuit for your next property? Yes. <laughs> well, today we're uncovering a passive and alternative investment strategy called note investing. We are going to break this down for you. And our guest, Amy Stavin, is the best person to tell you why, because she has a lot of experience with it. We're going to talk about performing notes, non-performing notes, first link, second link position. And this is going to be a guide for you to diversify your portfolio. So get a pen and paper and get ready. So Amy, for all the investors out there that are frustrated that a lot of deals are not making financial sense, why they should pay attention to note investing in today's market. Okay, well, note investing, there's a lot of good points to note investing, especially in this market where the supply and demand, there is just prices are so high to buy real estate, um, you're not getting a deal. Uh, there's just not a lot of inventory out there. And it's frustrating for any investor who's trying to find a deal, right? It's There's just not a lot of deals to be had. So not investing, um, you know, is a practice of, you know, I don't want to, maybe I'm just going to be very general or specific, just so people understand what a note is. Um, just start from there. So you have NPLs, which are non-performing notes, and you have performing loans, you know, and basically these are mortgages. So you are looking to invest in buying paper, right? You're buying the note, you're buying the loan. Um, if you're buying a non-performing loan, which right now in this climate, there is a very large inventory of NPLs. Um, and there's a, a lot of different ways in which you can approach buying them. Um, and we can get into that later, but it's passive because you are not the landlord, you are the lien lord, right? So you are not worrying about paying the property taxes, property maintenance, you're, you, you, you have bought the note, you're worrying about the borrower paying their mortgage and you're collecting the interest. You know, it's a passive stream of income. Um, if it's performing, if it's not performing, your goal is to get it performing and you're going to be able to purchase a non-performing loan at a much bigger discount than a performing loan. So the whole, whole agenda here, um, and on, the, for PPR is we'll buy a whole tape of non-performing loans. And, you know, we have a whole team doing that for us. What we're going to do with those non-performing loans is hopefully get them re-performing. Because say you buy an NPL list at, and I'm just throwing numbers out, uh, 70 cents on the dollar for NPLs. You're going to turn around and sell a, a PL list of performing loans at 93 cents on the dollar. So that is, you know, that's the ultimate goal. Now, these are real estate backed. so. If the borrower can't perform, the borrower defaults, you have to take it through a uh, foreclosure. That's the, you know, that's what you don't want to do when you buy these. But if you have to, the silver lining is it is a real estate backed asset and investment for you. So your worst case scenario, and I always like to go into things, you know, not wanting the worst case scenario being, but being prepared for it, right? So you, you have in your back of your mind when you're buying, all right, worst case scenario, they don't perform. We default. We have to foreclose. We're going to sell it as an REO, which, um, and then you want to make sure the value of what you're purchasing, you're going to be able to sell it as an REO and, and get the return on your investment. I have so many different questions. So my first question though, my first follow up is that you got non-performing, you got performing, right? The two buckets. If you buy non-performing, you want to get it to performing. So, if if the whole point of note investing is not tenants and toilets and like the 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 you know like the labor intensive side of real estate, if you will, how do you get it performing then? 
Okay. Well, this is where, uh, for anyone, like it's, it, this is not really for an individual. You can buy singular notes from a bank or from a, another person. Um, but the real, you know, there's so much compliance, which is why you have to have a loan servicer. You know, PPR uses, you know, a, a loan servicer. And there's tons of them. There, you've heard of them. Carrington, Shellpoint, Fay, you know, all the loan servicers. You need to be in compliance. There are so many rules and regulations. So going in, if you want to buy a tape of por- performing or non-performing, you have to have a loan servicer who has all the certifications and compliance necessary to get your loan to perform. You know, I can't buy an MPL and then throw myself in and start negotiating with the borrower and everything else because I don't have the license and I don't have the um, ability to do that. It's a very regulated industry. Um, There's a ton of compliance. So you're really, I mean... The best way to do it, if you're a high wealth individual and you're going to buy a tape and you're going to be spending... When you say a tape, though, what do you mean by that? Okay. A tape is... So if a bank has, you know, say 500 assets, 500 loans that are not performing and they want to cut their losses, they want to get rid of them, they're going to set... They're going to put a tape out on the trade desk, you know, and there's all different trade desks all over the industry to where they're going to put it out there on the market for someone to bid on and buy. Um, so that's what a tape is. It's a, it's a long list. It's not one, one off or two loans. It's like 300 or 150. Like a roll, you know, a roll of like sticky tape. Of got it, got yeah. it, got it, got it. Okay. Who okay, came so, up with that? <laughs> <laughs> that Great. All right. Roll off tape. That's what we're going to go with. All right. So <laughs> I, we have those. So let's say I am an investor. I see those over there, but I am not licensed, so I'm not able to do that. So I need to have a um, loan officer or a, 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 com- a loan well, company. You don't need a loan officer to buy a, a tape of MPLs or PLs. You, But when you want to service them, you know, you need a loan. So you, you have to have it set up to where if you're going to bid on a tape and anyone if you have the money and you want to purchase a tape of non-performing loans, you just have to know that you're going to have to take that. Porf- if you win the bid, you're going to take that portfolio and you're going to have to give it to a loan servicer to to handle the aspects that they are in compliance with that you are not. Um, so it's one of those, a lot of people who want to get into uh, note investing or investing in notes are going to go through a, a private equity real estate fund or a hedge fund, or they're going to do it in a way in which they are um, have an operator handling the whole thing. And they're investing in it and they're saying, all right, we're going to invest in this. And that hedge fund or that private equity real estate firm is going to give you a 12% return. And that's what they're guaranteeing you, or they're not guaranteeing you. Nothing's guaranteed, but that's what they're saying. You know, this is a 12% return fund. You invest, you know, a million dollars. We're going to uh, the return is 12%. Um, and then the hedge fund or the private equity fund or the, whomever is going to handle the entire getting a servicer, the compliance, handling, trying to get the uh, loans reperforming to be able to sell them as performing and get the return on the investment. So let's scale it down, right? Because the, the women listening, like, I'm not interested in, in a tape. I'm a single girl. Right. <laughs> like I, I want right. singles. No, me neither. I want right. like okay. just like just just one. Let's talk about one. One one non performing, right? Would I still need the servicer if I have to uh work on converting from non performing to performing? Yes. Okay. So uh, you well, you would need someone who has compliance gotcha. to do so. Gotcha. And how does that look like? What is the cost of it? How long does it take? Or it all depends. With volume comes um, a level of less cost. So if you have, say, two to three notes that you want to buy, you're a single person, right? And you're like, I want to buy some notes. Um, and then you then you have to be in compliance and make sure you're doing the proper, you know, the last thing you want to do is put yourself in a position where you're going to get sued or someone's going to come at you and say you didn't handle the borrower correctly. Um, so you're going to take your two or three and then you're going to research loan servicers. 
you know, you're not going to go with the big boys because they're hugely expensive unless you have volume. So you're going to go out there and you're going to find someone who is qualified to service your loans. Um, that's affordable. Um, and I don't have expertise in who to call who's affordable to do that because we work in such volume. We use a, we use a Carrington or a Fay or a Shellpoint or yeah. Celine. Um, but there are smaller shops, right? You can find someone to service your loan who's affordable. Um, absolutely. If you're going to buy a one-off or a two-off. I'm curious to understand too about the mix of like performing loans and non-performing loans. Does that, is that impacted by the, obviously the economy and what's happening? Meaning like my ratio might be 20 to 80%, 80% non-performing and 20% performing. Um, or is it not matter? I'm curious because I think that's part of whether you're active or passive in this niche. That's important information to note because that's something that I would, I would want to ask you know, the private equity firm, right? I, I'd want to know their philosophy so I could say, wow, they really have their, you know what, together or they don't. So, uh, you know, as a passive investor, we have to be stewards, right? I, I want, I want, so how does that break down? Does it break down the way I'm thinking about it or is it different? Well, different funds buy different, well, PPR only buys non-performing loans, right? We would, yeah. we buy distressed assets. So, Right. So if it's non-performing, one, you're getting it at a, a much bigger discount. Our goal is to get it performing and then sell a performing tape to. So generally you're buying one or the other. You're buying a okay. performing. Got it. It's not like a mix of, of like no. properties in your, in your portfolio. Okay. Got it. No. It's like two, two, two different lanes, if you will. Okay. That makes sense. But when you buy, all right. So, but when you have your portfolio, like we buy 300 non-performing loans. We, our goal is to get as many of those performing as we can. So then at some point in our portfolio, yes, we have a hundred non-performing, 50 performing. We bought them as all MPLs. Oh, I see. Okay. We just are getting better upside right now on the 50 we just got performing. Mm. We may wrap them up and sell them off because, all right, now we, we have them performing. We bought them here. Now we can sell them here because we got them all. We got all the borrowers back on track. We modified their loans. We went through a process, you know, and, and oftentimes when a borrower is in default and the bank sells their note, right? Um, it sells a non-performing. The borrower then is, we're going to go back at the borrower. We bought the note at a different price, right? So we're going to be able to wheel and deal with them better than the bank that sold it because the bank kind of, did their insurance cut, said, we're selling this. It's your problem, right? So then, you know, we're in for for a different amount of money than the bank was. Um, we're going to be able to modify and maybe make that, uh, give them a better rate or give them a better um, end game, you know, final number or purchase price um, and get them to be able to perform again. Makes a lot of sense. I'm curious about the downside. You know, what what's the downside? We, we you know, there's, there's so many ways we can, and especially a lot of women who, who are listening are active investors, they're passive investors. What's the downside though of this particular niche? Obviously, you know, there, there's a downside to everything. I'm a multifamily investor, right? And I know that 80% of the portfolio that you guys focus on is more on the note side, but what's like the worst case scenario? For uh, the worst case scenario? Um, Buying non-performing. non-performing uh, okay, non-performing. so the worst case scenario is you didn't you didn't buy right, okay? And or you bought when the market was es- well, the market's very escalated now. So my first cautionary tale to anyone doing this is do your homework, do your diligence, know your values, find someone to you know boots on the ground, um, make sure you buy right at the right price. So say you do, like say you know you just bought it in the height of the market. You bought it when the market is right now, you know, 26% higher than it was three years ago. Um, so you buy it and you think, all right, I'm good. I'm solid. And you cannot get it to perform, meaning you are going to have to take it through foreclosure, which is one, a pain in the butt. It is not quick, right? These are occupied. You're dealing with evictions. You're dealing with uh, 18, 12 to 18 months just to get it to where you can even sell it as an REO. And then the market has crashed, right? And the value you bought it at, very escalated, great market. You're like, this is awesome. N- now you're selling it as an REO in a market that has taken a downturn, right? And you're going to take a hit on, you know, 
what you purchased it for, the note for, um, because you're also going through the whole expense of foreclosure time at the, you know, if the, if a borrower is not performing, you're paying the property taxes, you're handling all of the, what comes through the insurance for the property, you're paying the attorney to foreclose. Um, so that's the downside. So, so Amy, I might, the listeners might be thinking, how do I know am I buying this right, right? More specifically. So what, what factors should I consider when I am putting together my buy box? What are like the three things that I must know? Is there a formula? Is there a recipe? What should I never do it? What should I consider? What should I always do it? Is there a formula? Yeah. Every, you know, PPR has their buy box and every, every investor should have a very specific in, and everyone's buy, you know, people have different buy boxes for sure. Um, what I would recommend is stick to your buy box. So if you're going to say, all right, I'm not buying, I, I want to buy in this location, this zip, zip code. If you're in, you know, say you're in New Jersey, which is where I am, this is my familiar territory. And that's the only place that my buy box is because it's the only comfort I have. I have a team. I, I know the market, whatever. So if someone's coming in, be very specific in your buy box. You know exactly where you're willing to and not willing to buy. So, you know, if, if you're Southern Florida, stick to Southern Florida. Then have your parameters. Look at median incomes. Look at square footage. Look at the age of the home. Like PPR doesn't look at homes that are built prior to 1960 or what on the norm because you know then you're dealing with levies, but you're dealing with a whole other ball of issues and deferred maintenance and everything else. So make sure you, you know, stick within the parameters of your buy box. So, you know, for PPR, we like it to be 19, you know, really, we'd like it to be 1990 or about, but we'll go 1970. We won't buy anything that's under um, 600 square feet, maybe exceptions, California on rare occasion. But, you know, we won't go for small square footage. We also won't go for huge acreage, right? I don't want to buy a property that's on six acres of land that I have to take care of in the interim of trying to, you know, so be very clear on your boundaries and your buy box. And, and the, the, just one clear question. You mentioned 70 cents on the dollar. Is that the, the sweet spot for you guys? I hate to give one number because it's so market-based. Um, yeah. If, you know, sometimes you, you could, and if it's a first lien, you're not going to do second liens. You, you can do like 40, 30 cents on the dollar for first, first liens. Yeah. You're 68, 72, 75. Some people go up to 77. You know, you're good. You're not going to go much higher than that on a non-performing loan. Um, even in a killer market, it's just kind of industry norm, but who's to say it, it, they go for what someone's willing to pay for it. Right. So so other question, is it mostly single family homes or is it a certain amount of unit up to a certain amount of units? Is it considered like residential, less than five units? Less than, we usually do less than four as we consider, you know, they're small multifamily, but for the most part, uh, we do single family. Um, but I consider like when we're looking at a tape, a four unit is considered an, in our minds, like a single family. Like it's, it's not like a, a huge commercial building, right? So when we talk about performing notes, does the cents on the dollar change based on, on that too? 100%. So you buy a non-performing note at, will just be 70 cents on the dollar. Um, performing notes are always, always at least 90, usually 95, sometimes even higher than that. The sweet spot's 93, right? So you're going to go from 70 cents on the dollar to 93 cents on the dollar. And the other beautiful thing is you are hoping in the market that you're in, as you're getting your NPL to, to be a performing, that also the, the value of that asset is increasing as the market is increasing. You know, nationwide, we're still as shocking as it is in a market where prices are, you know, they're not escalating like they were, but they're still escalating. What you buy value-wise today, two years from now, should be worth three to 6% more if the market stays kind of balanced and stable. You know, it, it, so you have 
where we just were, where it went crazy. And I think we're going to balance. And I think the market's writing itself now. Um, but, you know, and you can also have a scenario where the market goes south, you know, goes bad, really, <laughs> and then not in a good way. Um, you know, I think we've set up everyone when when COVID happened and when interest rates went so low. I mean, there was a lot of talk, right, about what's going to happen to the market. And none of us have a crystal ball. Um, but I do think they put safeguards in place after 2008 to assure that we never were in that dramatic of a down of a, a situation again. Right? So I don't think we'll see that. Absolutely. So now, now I want to talk about like first lien and second lien position for, for a second, right? Because when people think about second lien positions, like why would one do that? So my question to you is like, why would one do that? Okay. Well, I will tell you PPR started as a second lien note buyer. And that's in 2007, that was the business model. So and and they pivoted because Dave now was they crazy don't. that time. <laughs> <laughs> no, and but try, I mean, it is not talk about getting a good deal. Yeah. Like if you're buying a second lien, um, generally they're smaller. You know, they're small. Like someone will have their first lien and they want to take a twenty thousand dollar second mortgage, right? And then they default on that. So it's a smaller percentage. And you're still subject to your first lien. So if that becomes non-performing, oftentimes like you can get those four pennies on the dollar, you know, because the banks just want to get rid of them. So here's the plus and minus. You can buy, say someone defaults on a twenty thousand dollar, you're gonna buy it for seven grand, okay? Even less, maybe. So you own that. You own that. There the borrower is performing on their first lien, right? So we're going to try and get that borrower to perform on the second. If we can't get them to perform, if there's equity there saying what they owe the first lien is not, is like, say the property's worth 400 grand. Their first lien, their mortgage on their first lien is 260 grand. You purchased your second lien for seven grand. You can't get the borrower to perform, but they're still performing on their first lien. You can foreclose. As a second position lien holder, you then own the property. You can oh, Dave, sell. You're smart. <laughs> you can then sell the property. You just have to pay off the first. So we are subject to the first. So so let's just summarize that for a second, right? So the 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 key here is to when when evaluating second lien positions is to make sure that the first lien is performing. And then the second lien, it's not performing. And the goal is to make it perform or foreclose on something that it is performing. Right. If it's not performing on the, if, if it, if your second lien is not performing, you can foreclose on the but whole you thing. Are subject, yeah. You own the house, but you have, but you have to pay off the first lien. So you are subject to the first lien. So they're going to give you their UPB, their payoff. You can sell the property and pay off the first lien and the borrower's out of luck, right? Because you just bought their house and paid off their lien. You own the house full and in any quick. profit that it's there, it, it will be mine. I've, I've seen PPR, you know, I've done second lien deals where PPR has made like 100 to 150 grand on, on a, on a deal they bought for five. Because the market escalate in specifically, you know, in high escalating markets like California, we, we did a bunch of second liens recently that, you know, we bought for and we've carried. So you, you have your costs and your legal and all of that. So your, your second lien that you buy at five grand and then you have to go through default foreclosure attorney, you know, your second lien that you bought for five grand, you're now in it for 18, mm -hmm. right? Mm hmm. But, but then you know the value of the house and, and you did your math and it's worth it to go through the whole foreclosure thing because of that. Right. You don't foreclose on a second lien unless you, one, have a full idea and know what the first lien, know what know what the balance of the first lien. I'm raising my finger to get on Jess's... Um, I'm ignoring uh, it because I was like... I know. We're both like <laughs> fighting to ask you questions, Amy. I'm like, you know... You know, Andressa. So here's my question. I, I think a lot about, we think about a lot about markets because, 
you know, people get so inundated with deals and they don't think enough about the market, especially coming from like a multifamily side. And I know you guys invest in multifamilies and notes. Yeah. So from a market perspective, like you just mentioned California, right? High price, high tax, you know, state. Is there certain types of markets that are very like you would evaluate very similar to like looking for a really good multifamily? Is that similar from like a market analysis perspective, notes versus like small multis? Is it really the same or is there a different? Like actually markets for note buying, we really look at like high, you know, high priced class A, you know, that type of um, appreciation markets that are just very high priced and we can get as a good deal because we would look at, we would, you know, mark, uh, multifamily, we may not want to do that. So I'm just curious, being in both of those areas, how does that impact market analysis in particular? Well, there, it's definitely a different analysis. Um, so what we, where we're going to look to buy multifamily and invest in a multifamily is very different than where we're going to look to invest in, you know, buying, and we don't buy seconds anymore. Um, but we, you know, where we're going to buy, usually MPLs are, you're better off having like all over the country because you're just mitigating your risk. Because if one area doesn't do well, another area is going to cover that area. But now in multifamily, you're buying one thing, right? So you're really going to be specific as to where you want to purchase. Performing and non-performing loans, you know, if you're only going to purchase one or two, yes, you're going to go for high value markets that where there's going to be a, su- a, su- a substantial return of, you know, but um, for the most part, multifamily, we're buying one product in a specific area where we, you know, we have economists and analysts and you're very confident in that area. Yes. Where, mm-hmm. you know, PPR definitely has their buy box in their multifamily um, and, and in MPLs. It's more that, you know, they want it spread out everywhere. So, so Amy, like if I am somebody, right, here, here's the thing. They, I, can hear, I can listen to this podcast. I can read a book. I can read Dave's book about note investing. I can do all of that. And I have a learning curve. I'll make mistakes. And then a lot of people that are listening, like, I don't want none of that. I don't want none of that. I don't want none of that, right? And I think that where I am right in my life right now, I don't want none of that. I don't want to be the one learning everything versus my strategies to associate myself with people that has done it, have made the mistakes, they pay for their mistakes and I take advantage of that, right? I, I just don't, I'm not there anymore in this stage of my life currently. And I'm not I'm looking- right there with you, my life. <laughs> right? Like I, I, I ain't doing that anymore. I'm more like through association, through collaboration, to other, other companies that have done that. And I don't want to be the one calling freaking- uh, people about their toilets. They're nothing like that. I also don't want that. But I, I am, I have a problem on my plate. Diversification and, and investing passively and in different areas where I can mitigate my risk. So if I am that person, that person, what are my options uh, working with PPR? Okay. Well, PPR has, you know, we are diversified. Um, one of the pivots be, when they start as just a second lien shop. Um, and when you have all your eggs in one basket, I think in any er- arena, um, the potential to take a hit is far greater if you, in, unless you diversify. So PPR took that, um, did well with their second liens, but also got burnt on some, right? You, you're never going to hit a home run every time. And people who say they do are uh, frankly lying to you. Um, any investor who tells you they've never made a bad deal <laughs> or is not telling you the truth. In my opinion, you know, they're just not. Liz, were you <laughs> lying to me? <laughs> it's like saying your kid Too never did mistakes. anything wrong in their life or you never did, right? For or sure. that, oh, my kid wouldn't do that. Like, come on. Let's, reality is we all, you know, you hope for. When I see that on social media, I, I just like, no, fa- I just want to just yell at the person in their face, like, there's no way you're batting a thousand, but go on. Right. Exactly. Um, and it's annoying when people can't, I'm big on like sharing the pluses and minuses. And more importantly, I think it's more important to share the failure. So PPR, 
multi, we have multi, we multifamily. We're invested in short-term business loans. We're invested in MPLs, trying to get them to PLs. So what we've done is we've taken, and now we're also investing in car washes and starting a whole new vertical, um, the ground up development. Uh, that's very new for PPR. It's something they haven't done. The reason we're pivoting, the reason we're doing all of these different things is to give more of areas to which to have safety and, and, and to be, all right, if one vertical starts not doing great, you have your other verticals that can support that until that one goes back and starts doing better. Like right now, our short-term business loans, that arena in across the country is struggling. Um, the interest rate rise really hurt hard money lending. Um, you're going to see a lot of fix and flips halfway done going to default. Um, I'm seeing it in, in our own portfolio, but nationwide, I've talked to people that's, there's a lot of default happening in hard money lending just because of the interest rates. Um, so, okay, we're going to, we're going to pivot. We're going to figure that out. We're going to make that turn that around. But in the interim, we're focusing on some great multifamily deals. We're focusing on buying more big tapes of MPLs. Um, just you, you kind of always have to keep your eye on the prize and look at the market and make sure that you are prepared to balance a plus and a minus, right? Yeah. And it's so important right now. I think so many successful investors that have been at this a long time. I know Jess and I know, you know Dave, the, the founder of PPR very well, and he's been at this a very long time. And and no one is in this business just like their head down. The, the markets markets change, opportunity shifts. So pivoting, there's a place for pivoting. It's just you know smart business. I mean, especially like going into like ground up construction, something that we're doing more of now than buying existing you know multifamily. So, um, Amy, thank you so much for for all the great knowledge. I got my wheels turning on node investing. To be honest, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm just as like, okay, where can I just park my money? And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, but where can all the uh, listeners learn more about you guys and get connected further with with PPR and yourself? PPR Capital Management. You can go on our website. Um, look us up. Everything you need to know about the funds we offer, from the team that works them um, to the to our strategy, is on our website. Uh, you can truly Google PPR Capital. Um, you know, we have tons of uh, colleagues who have done that will come up, um, have done presentations. We have an economist, we have an MPL specialist, you know, Dave Van Horn, a huge person on Bigger Pockets, is still very involved. You know, he stepped aside as CEO, he's chairman of the board. We have a new CEO, Steve Meyer, who came from um, SEI. So there's just an incredible team and network um, in PPR. In, in the five years that I've been P at PPR, it's gone from 13 to 15 employees. I think we're at 39 employees. They're, they're growing. You know, they're they're growing and starting new verticals. It's a very exciting. We're almost at a billion dollars of assets under management. Um, and I highly recommend for any real estate investor who wants to go into the private equity fund space where you want to just be very passive, right? You want to give a fund whatever money and have them handle it and you want your return and you want to do nothing. There's a lot of them out there, right? Do your homework. There's a lot of good ones. You know, obviously I think PPR is the best one. It's 17 years, we're tried and true, but there are really good funds out there. Um, but there are also ones that aren't. So do your homework, investigate, ask questions, you know, vet where you're putting your money, vet them serious. I think the most important thing you can do is um, do your homework and be informed. Awesome. And we're going to make it easier for you guys. Uh, PPR's website, we're going to put on our show notes so you guys can get in contact with Amy and all the PPR team. Amy, thank you so much for thank bringing you. all your knowledge here. We, we have all the other 100 questions that we didn't ask you for another time. <laughs> thank you so much, Amy. <laughs> 